and uh, welcome to the uh, second day of the second series of challenges uh, cases in oncology. Uh, today we have uh, three cases and it's my pleasure to co-chair uh, this uh, session with uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Nidal Bukhari, who's a consultant medical oncologist at uh, King Fahad Specialist Hospital in Dammam. <coughs> and uh, he will uh, start to introduce our first speaker. Please welcome uh, Dr. Nibad. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for this kind uh, introduction. Uh, our first session actually will be uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma case presented by Dr. Amina Tijani, who is a consultant medical oncologist at uh, King Abdelaziz Medical City National Guard Hospital, Riyadh. Dr. Amin treats uh, GU and CNS the last time I checked. Is that correct? Yes, I'm pressed. Ayo, <laughs> mashallah, <laughs> tabarakallah. And he will, uh, he will start, inshallah, very soon. The, the mic is yours, Dr. Allah. Thank you very much, Dr. Nidal, for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed al Garni, for inviting me to participate in this uh, challenging cases. So uh, uh, the first case I will discuss is, uh, I will share with you, this is a, a metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma. So let me share my screen. I think it's clear now. So Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Ajma'een. Uh, so this case uh, is, is, is actually is a very interesting case. Uh, he's a 56 year old uh, male at the time of diagnosis of uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma. Uh, initially he presented in September uh, 2010 with painless hematuria. His labs at that time within normal except his hemoglobin like uh, 113 and his creatinine within normal limits which uh, was 80. Uh, radiology requested for him, he did initially ultrasound of the abdomen followed by CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And uh, the CT showed there is a right lower pool mass, 7.6 by 5 by 7 centimeter, and this is most likely a renal cell carcinoma. So in September 2010, he underwent right radical nephrectomy. And the pathology uh, was clear cell renal cell carcinoma conventional type, which was grade two. The tumor size was two, uh, six centimeter and the pathological staging was T3 at that time. Then after that, the patient continued on uh, surveillance from uh, September 2010. Uh, Unfortunately, after two years exactly, he developed a right lower lobe nodule, which measured 1.3 by 2.6 centimeter. He underwent excisional biopsy and right lower uh, lobe wedge, right lower left lobe wedge resection. And the pathology reported as metastatic renal cell carcinoma. We know in metastatic renal cell carcinoma, risk stratification is very important. We have two models here, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center, which by Mozer, which uh, uses LDH, hemoglobin, calcium, performance status, and time from RCC to systemic treatment. And this actually was in the interferon era, and uh, the risk stratification was we have three categories, favorable risk, intermediate, and poor risk. And the survival for favorable was 30 months in this uh, uh, study, and 14 months for the intermediate, and five months for the poor risk. The, the other model, which was used in the targeted area, time, which is IMDC uh, risk stratification, and it is used more or less the same, but they remove LDH and they are adding uh, neutrophils counts and platelets counts. And uh, the favorable risk, the survival, median survival about 43 months, intermediate risk 22, and the poor risk around uh, 7.8 months. So for our patient at this stage, he, he's uh, 
Mimolus uh, Lancaster increased score was zero. Uh, hemoglobin was normal, LDH normal, corrected calcium, and his performance status was one at that time, and time from treatment, which is more than one year, which is two years. But now he had only single lesion, which was resected. So what to do next? This was in 2012. Uh, the patient recurred, and then the resection was done. It is only single lung lesion. To go for observation, or to start sunitinib, or to start pazopeny, or all of the above are valid uh, options. Uh, and this raises a question here, is there a rule for systemic therapy after surgical treatment for metastasis of renal cell carcinoma? Actually, the evidence is, is low in this uh, 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 things. And there is some studies, and there is one uh, conducted uh, 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 and it showed that, concluded that metastectomy plus adjuvant immunotherapy did not result in higher overall survival. And this paper was published and that there is no role of adjuvant therapy after complete metastectomy in metastatic RCC. And actually there is some evidence also based in case reports, small series of patients, and those mainly treated uh, with adjuvant uh, uh, drugs after new adjuvant therapy plus metastectomy in cases of partial response to, to initial systemic treatment. So generally, it is, it is low evidence. So for this case, actually, uh, if I am the treating physician, I will not give him anything. I will observe. Him. But at that time, the treating physician used the study of uh, sunitinib uh, which uh, uh, is published in 2007, and at that time for metastatic RCC ferris line with no, no, with no prior systemic therapy, measurable disease, and good performance status, and patient randomized to sunitinib, uh, 50 milligram uh, once daily for uh, weeks on to weeks off, and compared to standard of care at that time, which was uh, interferon alpha. And the median progression-free survival of this study was significantly uh, in favor of sunitinib versus interferon alpha, 11 months for sutin, and about five months for interferon alpha. And also there is a trend for uh, median overall survival. So our patient at that time, the, the treating physician decided after resection of these lung lesions to start on sunitinib, he started two weeks on, one week off. And then after six months from sunitinib, this is his CT chest, abdominal pelvis, which showed there is no evidence of uh, recurrence in the chest or abdomen or pelvis, but there is two uh, sclerotic lesions in S1 and L3, and the bone scan showed also there is one suspicious at S1. So the patient continued on sunitinib, and he completed almost one year. And at that time, he developed hematological toxicity, especially severe anemia. His hemoglobin went down to 40. And his CT chest abdomen pelvis at that time, there is no changes. And the, st the bony disease are stable, which like two lesions. So nephrectomy, September 2010, then lung metastectomy, then suit and start suiting, and let us see what happens. So what to do next here? To hold the treatment and continue observation, or to change to basopony, or to change to axitomy. And the decision at that time to hold treatment and continue observation. There is no disease, and the patient is doing fine. Until after six months from that time, in May, 2014, he developed multiple right paravertebral plural based nodular masses, right hyaluronic lymph nodes, 1.6 by 2 centimeter, the lytic, lytic lesions in the rib, and those in the bone are stable. At the same time, on the same month, the patient had some symptoms like headache, I think, and CT brain showed there is 3.5 centimeter hyperdensity in the right occipital loop with edema and mild mass effect. And we know also Badopanib also approved in the first line. This is since long time. This study was 
2009. And at that time, bazopanib compared to placebo in the first line setting. And it showed uh, uh, the progression free survival, which was the primary endpoint uh, for this study, was significantly better in favor of, of uh, bazopanib versus placebo. Uh, this is in those who received prior systemic therapy, but in those with treatment naive, even the benefit was more. Uh, so the patient received radiation for his brain lesion, uh, received 20 grades in five fractions in June 2014. And also he received bazopanib from May 2014 till uh, October 2014, about five months. But unfortunately, his disease progressed again. And this is his uh, uh, CT chest, which showed there is increase in the size, multiple pleural base, metastatic soft tissue masses, no significant change to the necrotic right hyalur lymph nodes. The bone lesions are stable. So here he received bazopany. So let us go. So what is the next step will be here? Nivolumab actually is the second line which we are using currently. It was not approved at that time in uh, 2014. Axitinib is the standard second line, but it was not available in our hospital. And here we started Everolimus. The patient started Everolimus in October uh, 2014 for three years till uh, November uh, uh, 2017. And he received like 10 milligram. We know that most of our patients are not tolerating the full dose. The dose was reduced to 7.5 milligram, 5 mil uh, 7.5 milligram, and 5 milligram. Until November uh, 2017, he developed progression of his disease after three years of Everolimus. So this is his Everolimus, October 2014. And uh, this is his PET scan, which showed disease progression, right retrohyalur mass, increasing in size and metabolic activity worsening of the right pleural deposits and new metastatic deposit seen in, the, in his left adrenal. So what is the next step here will be? So nivolumab. Nivolumab was approved at that time. So we started him on nivolumab on uh, November 2017. And he continued on nivolumab for around seven months or six months. This is a study, Checkmate 025, which uh, is the phase three trial of nivolumab versus ivorolimus in the second line setting of metastatic RCC. And patient uh, randomized either to, to receive nivolumab, three milligram per kg every two weeks, or ivorolimus 10 milligram PO once daily until disease progression or unacceptable toxicity. And the primary endpoint here was overall survival and secondary endpoint, including PFS, objective response rates, and other secondary endpoints. And the primary endpoints was MET, which is the median uh, overall survival. And the median overall survival was 25 months in favor of nivolumab versus 19.6 months for Everolimus. So our patient received uh, uh, nivolumab and the CT here, our PET CT actually, showed there is significant improvements with almost resolution of, of the previous seen lesion, except for small area of the residual activity as the, uh, as the right retrohyalur region, and there is no new lesions. Till yeah. June, till June uh, 2018, he received around 16 cycle of nivoluma, but he presented with skin lesions over extremities for about two months duration. These are multiple eczematous plaques over the upper and lower extremities. And we refer him to dermatology and they diagnose it as having nummular eczema. They give him some topical treatment. And at that time, I decided to hold his nivelloma. So here, treatment, uh, hold it at uh, in June 2018, and from June 2018 till now, July 2021, our patient continue without therapy. All his radiological evaluation during this period was, was okay, and his overall survival actually was not reached here. 
This is his last PET CT scan, which was in March, which shows there is a stable calcified mediastyle and high lymph nodes with moderate hypermetabolism, likely related to chronic granulomatous disease. And the rest of the study remain unremarkable for hypermetabolic lesions of, of concern. So last time we saw him in May 2021, he was completely asymptomatic. His performance status was good, PET scan stable, and his off therapy, which the last one was nivolumab for almost three uh, years. So this patient diagnosed in 2010, 2010, become metastatic in 2012. And now we are in 2021 and he is fine. And I can say he's free from his disease. With this, thank you very much for your attention. I would say, mashallah, tabarakallah, excellent, very interesting case. Uh, really interesting. And I would like to open the uh, uh, panel now to for discussion. Uh, does anyone actually have any uh, questions to Dr. Amin Tijani or to Dr. Muhammad al garni or to myself? We're happy to receive questions. I just have uh, just one question, uh, Nidal. Uh, thank you, uh, Amin, for this interesting uh, case. So in patient with renal cell carcinoma, metastatic patient, is there any subset of patient that you would follow the watchful waiting without treating, or you have to treat all patients? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for this uh, question. Uh, actually, this is one of the options even in the metastatic disease, if the patient have minimal disease and he's completely asymptomatic, one of the option is to watch him and wait till he have progressive disease or developed symptoms. So one of the option is to observe definitely. Excellent. I agree with you, Dr. Tijani, slow growing biologies, definitely observation, watchful waiting is an option uh, in these guys. Uh, what I found really interesting in this case in particular uh, is the long, significantly, mashallah, long durable response this patient had to everolimus. Yani yes. I've never seen a patient responding to everolimus, mashallah, for almost three years. Um, it could be everolimus, it could be the, the, the uh, relatively good biology. But this is really good, Saraha. Um, yes, actually, this will raise the question: Is this is this uh, good biology? Is this is is it slow growing tumor? This, although he had he developed brain metastasis at some stage. Now, like seven years ago, he he had big lesion in his brain. So sometimes we are seeing cases like this. Actually, and and I have another two cases. They have the same scenario. They are long uh, after we stop, uh, namely nivolumab immunotherapy. They are have a, a durable response and they are now without any treatment. So Nidal, there is one question from yeah. the, uh, the audience uh, to Dr. Amir regarding what is your opinion in nephrectomy for patient with metastatic RCC? Uh, okay, nephrectomy, this, this, is, this is a big topic. Actually, nephrectomy, metastatic disease, this is, uh, uh, the, uh, we have the Carmina trial, the last trial, which showed there is no benefit, uh, especially for, for those with poor risk, uh, poor, poor and intermediate risk. But for favorable risk, it is uh, one of the option. So nephrectomy nowadays should be done selectively for those patients with metastatic disease. Not like before, all patients we are doing for them cytoreductive nephrectomy, but currently we need to select them. Those with poor performance status, having aggressive disease, there is no benefits as per uh, Carmina trial. I agree with you, Dr. Tijani, 100%. However, you may actually get this question from urology every once in a while regarding patients with intermediate risk uh, RCC based on 
Danny Hink criteria, IMD seed criteria. So their argument would be uh, the Carmina trial basically used Mozart criteria when actually uh, they looked at nephrectomy in those people. But when the same group, Megan, I believe from Netherlands, looked into it, they found out that when they applied uh, Danny Hink criteria, patients with intermediate risk with one point only uh, benefited from cytoreductive nephrectomy. So it's something that may come up in tumor boards every once in a while. And uh, um, yeah, this, this is an option definitely and then based on the findings. But I agree with you 100%, based on Mozart criteria, yes. Yeah. If you allow me, Nidal, I have a question for you and for Dr. Amin. Yeah. Now, uh, with the recent data about the uh, nivolumab in the uh, adjuvant uh, setting, so do you think this is something that you will apply to your practice to you start to use immunotherapy at earlier stage? I, I mean, uh, restricted RCC? May I take this, uh, Dr. Tijani? Yes, of course. Yes. So my, my short answer would be, I, I, I will still wait for the data to mature. The second thing is, most of those medications, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, pembrolizumab, uh, immunotherapy, all immunotherapy, are bacteriostat or sorry, tumorostatic medications. So are we just giving them? to delay the tumor from coming back? Or are they really killing the tumor? So the, this is a very debatable, controversial topic. And Saraha, I will need يعني, um, uh, more mature data to, to, to make that call. Currently, I'm not doing it, Saraha. But I'm happy the, to hear from Dr. Tijani. Yes, also the same. We are currently actually we are not giving uh, adjuvant adjuvant therapy for uh, uh, RCC, and even before sunitinib, there is positive studies. I think there is two positive studies for sunitinib and, and one negative uh, for high risk. But still, we are not giving. Some parts of the world, like the United States, I think they are giving for the high risk. They are giving uh, uh, adjuvant sunitinib, namely. For nivolumab, I totally agree with you. Uh, the data is still uh, needs to be more, more mature to, to go for it. And I think uh, one of the uh, challenging uh, thing with all these immunotherapies, the, the long duration for one year to give this treatment and the cost that you will add to, uh, exactly. to that. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, so there is one question in the from the audience to Dr. Amin. What is your preference for non-clear cell RCC metastatic cases? Okay. For non-clear cell, there is no actually data because non-clear cell, uh, the cases usually are uh, low numbers, so and not included in most of these trials. Uh, but uh, for the metastatic, uh, uh, we are using the targeted therapy uh, mainly before, but nowadays immunotherapy, we can use immunotherapy the same what we are using for the clear cell histology. So, uh, I think if, if today one patient uh, patient came to me with 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 uh, non-clear histology, I will use the same what I am giving for clear cell histology. Although most of these studies are not including those patients, so even immunotherapy is, is valid if if uh, Dr. Nidal agree with me, and also the TKI is also is valid. Uh, yeah, definitely. A lot of my colleagues. Uh have switched to, to dual immunotherapy or immunotherapy plus exitinib uh, or a TKI-based treatment, extrapolating from the clear cell, and that is perfectly fine. However, I'm still old school when it comes to papillary type and chromophobe. I would use uh, sunitinib, still go with sunitinib, and mainly in papillary. And in chromophobe, I will highly consider either everolimus or papillary based on phase two trials done. Um, again, uh, at the end of the day, unfortunately, it hit, it's hit and miss. I have papillary RCC cases. 
metastatic papillary RCC case, one case actually with complete response to sunitinib. And I know that one of my colleagues have a metastatic papillary RCC who received uh, dual immunotherapy with complete response as well. So I think both options are right. Yes, okay, yes, I agree with you. So uh, one question, uh, Dr. Amin and uh, Nidal. So now for, for RCC, I know now we are using immunotherapy, you, but do you have any predictive biomarker rather than the risk stratification? So in other tumor sites, as you know, the MSI, the PDL1. So what is the predictive biomarker that you will use in, in, in renal cell carcinoma that would help you to select the most uh, appropriate patients? Uh, you mean uh, for uh, like uh, immune TKI okay. or yeah, immune immune? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually, actually, there is no no biomarkers now approved to, to select patients. We are depending mainly on the on the clinical clinical characteristic of, of uh, the disease. So like not like doing PDL one and this is in in renal cell carcinoma. There is uh, um, nothing till now. To say this, can, we can select this over the other. I agree. No clinically validated biomarker, uh, as far as I know, uh, used for uh, treatment selection so far. I agree. Okay. Okay. So there is one question here uh, directed to me. So when to perform genetics in RCC patients? So, um, you know, RCC is like other tumor. There, there, there are some uh, uh, genetic, uh, uh, let's say genotype, phenotype association in patients with, with uh, renal cell carcinoma. So uh, the most common is the uh, PHL, Fin Hippolyndus syndrome, which is related to the hereditary germline mutation in PHL that is associated with clear cell uh, cancer and uh, other uh, extra renal tumor like hemangioblastoma and uh, uh, other uh, benign findings that you can find in the in the retinal exam. So definitely, uh, some uh, some patients with RCC uh, the 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 uh, they need to be tested. One factor is multiple primaries in one individual is is uh, is is one indication. The second thing is bilateral RCC is uh, sometimes is uh, an indication to test for germline uh, mutation. The, uh, the histology itself sometimes is an indication to, uh, to treat, and there are certain uh, genetic mutation associated with certain uh, types. So this is briefly, it's a big topic, but this is uh, just uh, briefly, and all of this has to be done in the context of genetic clinic because you know, uh, ordering the appropriate gene test and interpreting the result also important because this has consequences on the patient and in the family of the patient. So it has to be interpreted in, 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 uh, with certain expertise. Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, Nidal, can we move to, thank you, uh, Dr. Amin, very interesting case. And I think we can move now to the second case, Nidal. Okay, absolutely. Um, we now actually move to the second case, which is uh, a case presented with uh, Dr. Muhammad al garni uh, well known to everybody, mashallah, tabarakallah. Uh, Dr. Muhammad al garni is a consultant at King Abdul Aziz Medical City, and he kindly invited me tonight to moderate this session. He's gonna talk about a uh, genetic case, and I'm sure it's gonna be informative and interesting as usual. Thank you, Nidal. It's our pleasure to have you actually. So uh, my, my case is uh, actually, it's a mix. It's a pancreatic cancer case, but it also has some genetic uh, component. Uh, and there are some learning points that uh, I would like to share uh, with our audience. So uh, this is a 66 year old uh, male patient. He is known to have diabetes and oral hypoglycemic agent. He presented uh, on March, 2020 with uh, symptoms of uh, abdominal pain, loss of appetite and non-intentional uh, weight loss. So he went to uh, another hospital where they requested for home CT scan based on these symptoms. 
and the CT scan uh, showed a pancreatic body and tail uh, mass, and uh, there are some mesenteric nodularity and caking on, on CT scan. In addition, there was some uh, vascular involvement by the pancreatic uh, mass. So uh, he was uh, referred to uh, our clinic. We saw uh, the patient, we reviewed his CT scan. The CT scan also showed some um, pulmonary nodule, uh, but uh, it was indeterminate at the beginning. So the radiologist recommend for a further follow-up. So, uh, as you know, we have to get a tissue diagnosis for patients with cancer. We ask the interventional uh, radiologist to do a biopsy. However, they were able only to do a CT-guided fine needle aspiration that was positive for malignant cell adenocarcinoma. His baseline uh, CE99 was 652. Uh, I saw him first in May uh, 2020. Uh, he had excellent performance status uh, and uh, based on this uh, and the result of the pathology and the clinical and radiological findings, we started on, on uh, falperinox as standard of care for a fit patient with metastatic pancreatic cancer. At that time, I requested for him comprehensive germline panel, um, which I do for all my uh, pancreatic cancer patients. So, I saw the patient uh, after two cycles of therapy. He had good tolerance to treatment. He has significant improvement in his symptoms. However, his CE99 increased to 927 after three cycles. So uh, what we should do at this stage? So one of the uh, recent publication uh, this year is uh, uh, this paper that looked to the chemotherapy induced early transient increase and surge in CI-19 uh, level in patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So these are a cohort of patients who were treated with fulfirinox or gym uh, apraxane, and they looked to the level of CI-19 uh, for those patients. So as most of the patients who responded to therapy, initially they have some surge or increase in the level of CI-19 and then it starts to uh, decline. So the duration of surge, as you can see here in the uh, right side, it's ranged from 12 to 16 weeks. So it's even after starting the uh, therapy with, uh, and the patient is responding, still they, you can have a surge or elevated CA199 uh, for some times. And this is uh, very important because the relying only on a tumor marker to decide about switching therapy is, 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 will be um, uh, incomplete or inappropriate decision in such cases. And uh, we have to take the clinical presentation or the clinical symptoms of the patient in addition to the radiological finding and the, uh, the level of the tumor marker into consideration and interpret the, the data as a whole rather than looking to the tumor marker itself. And this is one of my other patients. This is a patient with colorectal um, cancer. And as you can see at the time of the diagnosis here on the right, her CE9, CEA was 8,000. And after two cycles of chemotherapy, it, they couldn't measure it. It's reached more than 15,000. However, the patient clinically was responding. And as you can see, the trend of CEA after that came down. So. The learning point here is uh, 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 relying on tumor marker alone in assessing the uh, response for someone who's responding clinically and radiologically is, is uh, consider, you know, an, uh, 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 I would say uh, incomplete uh, assessment for, for the patient. So you have to take the patient as a whole and not relying only on the tumor marker. So I decided to continue the therapy and uh, CT repeated and showed stable metastatic advanced pancreatic cancer with marked enlarged heterogeneous prostate. So we did PSA at that time and it was six and this is, has, uh, uh, you know, uh, relative to uh, the patient genetic findings. And when I saw him at that time, the CE99 dropped to 713 and the patient is still uh, doing well with good tolerance and uh, uh, no significant side effect. 
So I got the result back for his uh, germline uh, testing and the finding showed that this patient carry a pathogenic mutation in the PMS1 gene. And we'll come to that in a second. So uh, he was continued on chemotherapy and CT scan repeated in September, 2020. And it showed interval decrease in the size of the pancreatic mass and the peritoneal metastasis consistent with partial response to treatment. He has stable microndules in the, um, in the lung and the radiologists think it's maybe uh, benign in nature and just we need to uh, follow it. And his CE199 continues to drop to 440. At this stage, the patient developed grade three neuropathy and I have to omit the oxaliplatin and the patient maintained on full theory and no more oxaliplatin was given. I repeated his scan in December 2020 that showed stable pancreatic and omental disease, but his CE99 dropped further to 74. So based on the result that the patient has with PMS1 mutation, which is considered part of the mismatch repair uh, pathway, and thinking that this patient might benefit from certain therapy, which is the immunotherapy. I want to confirm that the patient has microsatellite and a stable tumor in order to use uh, immunotherapy in the future. And this is important point in patient with pancreatic cancer, because you know, with time they might progress, you have to plan your treatment in advance. So I discussed with the interventional radiologist if we can get a biopsy to do the microsatellite instability and to test for the PMS1 in the tumor itself. However, the, uh, uh, our interventional radiologist, when he scanned the patient, he couldn't find any visible masses in the, uh, in the mesentery. And at that stage, I decided to continue home in chemotherapy and to do a PET scan as a follow-up to see uh, if the patient continued to have uh, metastatic disease or not. So in April 2021, uh, we did the PET scan and it showed only some activity in the primary tumor mass but there was no activity in the peritoneal disease. And at this stage, his CA99 normalized. It's now 33. And the patient feels well, no symptoms, excellent tolerance. His neuropathy starts to uh, diminish. So I discussed this case with my uh, colleague from radiation uh, oncology. And since the patient showed impressive response to chemotherapy, and his CA199 dropped nicely, and his PET scan did not confirm uh, uh, extra pancreatic metastatic disease. We decided to treat him with uh, radiation therapy, and he received SPRT to the pancreatic mass in uh, uh, this month, in the 1st of, of July. He completed his uh, treatment, and I'm planning to see him again in four weeks for follow-up. So, Looking for the genetic perspective for this patient now, this is the NCCN guideline recommendation for the workup for patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And you can see here that germline testing is, uh, uh, is indicated if the diagnosis is confirmed. And if we look to the data uh, from where this recommendation came, there has been multiple reports of uh, a series and cohort of patients from unselected population from different countries. And it showed that testing patients with pancreatic cancer with multi-gene panel result in identifying more patients rather than sticking to the uh, clinical guidelines for genetic testing. So in uh, one of the biggest studies that looked for 800, uh, more than 800 uh, patients with pancreatic cancer, so they are unselected which means they didn't look or correlate with the family history and they tested for 32 gene and the rate of positivity was 3.9. In the other study where they have 96 unselected population with a smaller panel, the rate of positivity was 13.5. This data from uh, Memorial Sloan Catering, they looked for more than 600 uh, patients and they tested them for uh, their uh, panel, which is a comprehensive uh, panel for germline alteration was found in almost 20% of the patient. So the BRCA1 and BRCA2 was the commonest, and there are 
uh, 4% of other pancreatic cancer associated genes. And also they found none known pancreatic cancer gene also were positive in those population. And the interesting thing, as you can see here, 50, almost 41% of the patient who carry a mutation did not meet our current guideline for genetic testing. So this is the case that where you have to screen patient for, um, for germline testing um, regardless of their family history. Our experience in, uh, in, in, in National Guard, we have a limited number of patients, so around 82 patients tested so far, and the rate of positivity is about seven to 8%. Uh, and most of them, they don't have any family history. And uh, the commonest mutation that we have so far is the BRCA2 mutation. So what is the importance of this? It's not only about uh, germline testing and the risk assessment and prevention of cancer. It's, it's extent to, to the therapeutic option for the patient. So we know now it's a part of the management of patient with uh, BRCA2 BRCA1 or 2 associated uh, uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer who express good response or stable disease and platinum-based uh, chemotherapy maintenance olaparib uh, can provide uh, uh, progression-free survival advantages for those population. So back to our patients. So we have this PMS1 gene. So it's considered part of the mismatch repair pathway, although it's less commonly uh, reported. We, I think most of us, we are familiar with the PMS2, MLH1, MSH2, and MSH6. However, PMS2 is consider part of the mismatch repair pathway. So you would expect for someone who carry germline mutation in PMS1 to have a microsatellite and a stable uh, tumor. And this has a, a, a value for our patient because as I mentioned, it, it, it provides a therapeutic, effective therapeutic option for those uh, patient. If you look to all the cases of pancreatic cancer, it's very, very rare to have this mutation. It's about 0.36 percent reported. I haven't come through across any cohort of patient that uh, of pancreatic cancer uh, patient who carry the PMS1 and we are planning to to write our uh, case for publication. So is this finding relative to our patient? So is this a true germline mutation? You know when we what we do now to test patient for germline uh, mutation we do a blood test. So sometimes there is a concern about the somatic mutation, it's rather than germline mutation. However, in this patient, I have tested all of his uh, uh, first degree relatives, and I found that three of his sons carry the same mutation. So we are dealing with truly a germline mutation. Uh, how we can use this information? As I mentioned, part of this is related to the patient himself. So in the future, if he needs, we need to confirm that he has microsatellite and stable tumor. And if he progressed, my plan is to give him immunotherapy as a second line. And for the family, of course, it has a, you know, a role for risk assessment and, and uh, prevention. So what is the learning points from this case is uh, interpretations of tumor markers should be done in the context of clinical and radiological findings. Germline testing should be part of assessment for patients with pancreatic cancer. And utilization of genetic testing result goes beyond prevention and risk assessment to therapy. And by this, I conclude and thank you very much. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Very interesting case, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Well presented. And uh, I learned something new, Allah. Um, so now we are actually. Uh, uh, open, we're actually, we're gonna start to receive questions from uh, audience directed to Dr. Muhammad and myself and Dr. Amin Tijani. Okay, so the first question is, uh, the kind of RCC case. We don't have uh, questions from in the chatting box. But if you have comment, Nidal or Dr. Amin, I'm, I'm happy to. طيب والله أول حاجة جماعة you guys ما شاء الله تبارك الله are so lucky and privileged uh, to have your stuff done locally at National Guard. Uh, 
uh, what is the average timeline usually for having those tests to come up? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nidal. So uh, I think the, uh, the one, of, one, one of the most important thing to help you as an oncologist is to have a lab that, you know, understand the field of oncology and how quick it's evolving and they match the speed of the field. So we are lucky to have a very supportive molecular lab in, uh, in our hospital. We, for germline testing, we have uh, two way to do it. We started to do, if we are looking for BRCA1 and BRCA2, we started to do it in-house, if you are looking specifically for BRCA1 or BRCA2. But if you are looking for comprehensive panel, like what I do, we still, we send them uh, outside. So for the BRCA1 and BRCA2, it's about two to three weeks to get it in the, in the hospital. And Very for good. the outside sent uh, test, it takes four weeks to six weeks maximum. Okay, but that's actually very good. Yeah. Our yeah. timeline is longer a little bit. So uh, that actually sometimes prevent us from actually considering uh, ulaparib uh, in those patients. But I know that uh, uh, ex expedited testing is funded for ovarian and breast cancer, as far as I know, not for pancreatic or prostate cancer. But, uh, I have a question to uh, relapse the class below. Dr. Mohammed, you are doing now for all pancreatic, all cases of pancreatic cancer, you are doing for them the genetic. Yes. Okay. Yes. But, uh, I have a question in a metastatic setting to Dr. Mohammed. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Gurney, what do you prefer um, in metastatic setting as upfront treatment in patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer? Um, do you prefer a combination like cisgem uh, in uh, BRCA positive patients? This is a very good question. So. I think the uh, patient with, with uh, BRCA2, or sorry, with BRCA, with our one or two, we are not talking now about BRCA1 or two. We are talking about the homologous recombination pathway, which include multiple genes, including BRCA1 and two. And they share the characteristic of responding to DNA damaging agent like platinum based uh, therapy. So for patient with BRCA1 or two mutation, if I have the information before uh, you know, hand, I think my, my, my goal is to expose them to platinum-based chemotherapy. So cisplatin and gemcitabine still, I think it's effective therapy, but I might consider it for someone who is ECOG2 or not very fit to receive therapy, but I will still go with fulfirinox for patient who ECOG0 to 1 with BRCA mutation. Excellent. Uh, what is your preferred method of pancreatic biopsy, EOS, or CT-guided? Um, what I think what matters to us the most is to have a tissue that actually can be sent for uh, molecular biomarkers. But these days, I, and in my institute, mostly it's EOS-guided uh, biopsies. I'm not sure about you guys. Yeah, so... Uh... You know, the, the issue with the patient with pancreatic cancer, the, the get, ob obtaining a tissue is not easy for localized or uh, early stages. It's always difficult even when you discuss with our interventional radiology, because when we come to the question about offering new adjuvant therapy, you need to get a tissue diagnosis. So if the patient is resectable upfront, I, th I don't think we need a tissue diagnosis because the patient is going to OR anyway. But if you are adapting in your center that you need to give the patient systemic therapy or new adjuvant chemotherapy before uh, sending the patient to the uh, whipple surgery, I think you should get a tissue diagnosis. And most of the time we get FNA. Excellent, excellent. So uh, Allah, excellent presentation, uh, very good questions. Uh, but I'm afraid we need to move now uh, yes. for the sake of time to the last case. Dr. Amin Tijani's case, uh, the mic is yours, Dr. Amin. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nidal, but I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, 
so this is uh, my second case. It will be uh, about uh, prostate uh, cancer. So the, the case is a 68 years old uh, uh, male, and he presented initially with abdominal pain and vomiting and sent for our in our hospital for workup. Uh, his laboratory workup uh, was within normal range. And uh, the CT just show multiple enlarged necrotic mediastinal and hyaluronic lymph nodes, the largest about 1.1 centimeter. And there is a small left-sided pleural effusion. But uh, his CT abdomen showed uh, there is a large retroperitoneal mass completely encasing and anteriorly displacing the aorta, inferior vena cava, and renal vein without causing invasion, encasing the celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, also extending into the left renal hilum. Uh, actually, this is very, very big disease. And the conclusion of his abdomen CT is that this is a large retroperitoneal nodal mass with other nodal peritoneal and osseous lesions. And the overall picture is highly suggestive of lymphoma, less likely metastasis from primary testicular tumor. This is the radiology report. And there is a high suspicious suspicion of prostate cancer with invasion to the seminal vesicle for correlation with PSS level and prostate biopsy. This is a CT scan, very huge mass, very big mass, occupying almost the whole the retroperitoneal area. And this is also his CT. PET scan also done for this patient and short also large malignant looking mildly hypermetabolic retroperitoneal mass with mesenteric nodules and moderately hypermetabolic pelvic lymph nodes. The same finding like in the CT. And this is his PET scan also showed a huge mass although the activity is, is a bit uh, less than uh, what expected in those who are uh, uh, PET avid. This is his PET CT scan. So what will be the next step here? So definitely we will ask for the tissue. And usually are saying tissue is an issue. So the pathology diagnosis, they went from the retroperitoneal mass and needed core biopsy. And it's reported as poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm with neuroendocrine differentiation. And here you can see the immunohistochemistry of the tumor, the positive one, the pan-CK uh, are, are positive, synaptophysine, TTF1, PSA, and PSAP, and CD199. All these are, are positive, although they are focal or weak, most of them. And on the right side, we see here the negative tumor uh, markers, including CK7, CK20, and the others. And the pathologist uh, uh, comment for this, he, he said that this immune stains favor prosthetic primer. So the case is discussed in the tumor board. And uh, actually, I insist to take biopsy from the prostate, although the urology said twice to go for the prosthetic biopsy. You have already uh, a clear pathology. Uh, and they convinced to do it. And we do the prostate biopsy. And the prostate biopsy reported as prosthetic adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, glisson 9, poorly differentiated, it's screw 5, and it's positive for uh, perineural invasion and extra prosthetic extension also uh, was positive. After that, the pathologist uh, 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 want to do more immune stains in the previous one, in the retroperitoneal biopsy, and I think they send it to King Faisal Hospital and they request NKX3.1 uh, immune stain, which came uh, strongly positive in this. And the positivity of NKX3.1 uh, immune stain, I said in favor of prosthetic primary. And uh, usually they are saying for clinical correlation. So what is the next step here? Now we have the diagnosis for the patient with this huge retroperitoneal disease and the pathology uh, adenocarcinoma in the prostate with neuroendocrine differentiation and the pathology in the abdomen, it is poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumor.
So to start LHRH plus novel hormonal agents, or to start LHRH plus docetaxel, or we can add carboplatin etopside to LHRH, or to give docetaxel and carboplatin. Really, I need input from the panels about this. Uh, but the patient actually, I started him on uh, carboplatin etopside, and he received only two cycles now, the first one in, in 8th of June, and the second one, 29th of June, this is 2021. The same time I started him on biclotamide 50 milligram for 30 days to prevent the tumor flare co caused by liprolide. And he received all, the first injection of uh, liprolide with 22.5 milligram, received it on 28th of June, 2021. This is his PSA. This is his initial PSA, which was 32. This is on the diagnosis of, on 31st of May. Then, and this is like every two weeks repeated here. And 23 after he started the chemotherapy and then now it went to 9.4. This was in 28th of June. So uh, prostate cancer with neuroendocrine differentiation, actually this is a distinct phenotype. And, and rarely present de novo, less than 2% actually. It is more frequently arises following hormonal therapy in patients with castrate-resistant prostate, prostate cancer. Those patients who received ADD, they can develop neuroendocrine differentiation later. But the de novo is, is actually very rare. It is usually have aggressive uh, clinical course. The, PSA usually on the lower side because of low PSA production. Androgen receptor can be also negative in these cases. And it lack of response to hormonal therapies uh, in general. Relatively, it had resistance to androgen signaling inhibitors. And it has sensitivity to taxane and platinum chemotherapy. And generally, it had a very poor prognosis. And when we look for the classification of neuroendocrine neoplasts in the prostate, we have four uh, categories here, prosthetic adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, which uh, was uh, carcinoid, this is in the past, small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. I will go quickly, briefly over those. For uh, focal neuroendocrine differentiation, adenocarcinoma with focal neuroendocrine differentiation, actually this is seen in many prosthetic adenocarcinomas. And typically the tumor cells that are positive for neuroendocrine markers account only for a small percentage of the total. It can be observed in several types of prosthetic tumors and have different biologic and biochemical features. It accounts like 47 to 100% of cases of typical de novo prosthetic adenocarcinoma, but usually it is a high-grade tumor, usually not associated with aggressive clinical behavior. And actually, this is treated the same way as high-grade prosthetic adenocarcinoma. That I mean specifically about the focal neuroendocrine differentiation. There is another one, the pure neuroendocrine carcinoma, which include both small cell and large cell neuroendocrine cells. And this is treated differently than conventional prosthetic adenocarcinoma. The neuroendocrine differentiation may emerge in men who have previously had ADT, as I mentioned, for advanced castrate sensitive prostate adenocarcinoma. And at autopsy, 10 to 20% of men dying of castrate resistant prostate cancer found to have neuroendocrine differentiation. Treatment related neuroendocrine prostate cancer, usually with aggressive variants, increasingly recognized in the castrate resistant phases of disease progression. Well differentiated, this is another entity, primary well differentiated, are extremely rare in the prostate as the primary. It is morphologically similar to the counterpart in the gastrointestinal tract. And this tumor is usually positive for neuroendocrine markers and negative for PSA. A well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor of the prostate also may present with locally advanced disease or even metastasis, but it still had a good prognosis. Small cell, it is a rare primary tumor of the prostate. It is aggressive and fatal. 
and approximately 50% of small cell carcinoma of the prostate coexist with typical adenocarcinoma. The pathology diagnosis requires the presence of a significant number of small cell and differentiated old cells, carcinoma cells, which demonstrate neuroendocrine features that are histologically identical to small cell carcinoma of the lung. The large cell, uh, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma also is an entity that was newly incorporated in the last WHO classification. It's also maybe associated to small cell carcinoma or high-grade adenocarcinoma, and rarely had a high aggressive, and particularly the your form and is similar to small cell carcinoma in behavior. The clinical experience of optimal management in this uh, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is limited due to the rare of the disease. So what is the treatment of prostate cancer with neuroendocrine differentiation? Actually, there is no optimal way to manage patients with neuroendocrine differentiation unless to include them in clinical trial and chemotherapy used for the treatment of small cell cancer like platinum and etopside combination and it showed response 10 to up to 50%. So we return back to our case. Uh, uh, in summary, he's the 68 years old, a uh, uh, male presented with large retroperitoneal nodal mass with other nodal peritoneal and osseous lesion, high suspicion of prostate cancer with, with invasion to seminal vesicle, multiple enlarged mediastinal and hyalur lymph nodes. And the pathology from the retroperitoneal mass, it's poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm with neuroendocrine differentiation. Pathology from the prostate showed prosthetic adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, glisson 9, and poorly differentiated. His initial PSA diagnosis was 32. And he received two cycles of carboplatin etopside beside biclotamide and liprolide. His last PSA was 9. And his radi radiological evaluation actually still bending because this is a new case. After the third cycle, actually he will receive his third cycle next week. And then he, we will evaluate him with, with CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. So uh, I put this like we can discuss these points. What will be the next if he progressed? This is very, very important and, and challenging question. Is there any role of novel hormonal agents like uh, enzalutamide? or abiraterone? What is the role of immunotherapy? Uh, can we uh, use it like in the small cell lung cancer? Because in the small cell lung cancer, atezolizumab used in combination with carboplatin and etopside. I think in, in power uh, 133. Three. And what is the role of doing NGS or HRR, homologous recombination? Uh, uh, is, is it OK in this case? Because as, as we know, genomic analysis showed that DNA repair, mutation, and small cell neuroendocrine histology were almost mutually exclusive. So I don't think he will benefit from this, but I need the input from the panel. And by this slide, thank you. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, Doctor. Your cases today, Dr. Amin, are case report level. It will easily make it to a case report journal. Without publication, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amin, um, so most of the questions you ask are wallahi tough questions, and I don't think anyone knows the right answer for them. But uh, I would really like to keep us posted on what, uh, what would exactly happen uh, with this guy. Yes, definitely. If, you, definitely. if, you, if you ask me personally, what would I I consider if this patient fails carbo etoposide, the answer would be uh, either docetaxel based chemotherapy. I would put that on top of my list. And using a novel antiandrogen is not wrong. But if I had the option of using either enzalutamide or abiraterone, I would use enzalutamide in this setting due to its faster onset of action. Um, and I would continue the same conventional hormonal treatment, the LHRH agonists and whatever you started him on. Um, any, am I missing anything? Are there any 
things or points that uh, we may need to highlight? Uh, but, but as I mentioned, this is a very rare disease. Usually, as you know, we are seeing this after the initial treatment, but this is present, this is the initial presentation. Usually we are seeing it after the patient receives a hormonal, uh, uh, the hormonal therapy, and then after that become resistant to the treatment, and then we will do the biopsy, and we will find this is a rare neuroendocrine differentiation. Yeah. But cases presenting like this, this is actually, this is the first case to see, actually. And its treatment is very challenging, actually, uh, because the biopsy of the prostate showed also adenocarcinoma. Yes. So... So, the, so adenocarcinoma should be treated uh, with the conventional treatment, the hormonal therapy, whatever yes. novel hormonal therapy. Absolutely. And in this case, actually, I started both treatment. Uh, so I, I will not start novel therapy now for the time being because Absolutely. I'm, con I'm concentrating on the neuroendocrine because which is, you see this is very huge, very huge, big disease in his exactly. abdomen. What, uh, what you did, Dr. Amin, I think was very wise doublet, platinum doublet in this case was a very wise decision. And uh, it's very interesting and it's a very aggressive initial presentation. I would have probably done the same thing. My GU perceptor used to do something very interesting and very similar to what you did. He used ECF in those patients. And he published like case series of 14 or 15 cases that had very good response. That was maybe seven or six years ago. So ECF, so, uh, ECF, you mean, you mean? ECF, uh, the upper GI regimen, yes, yes. Epiriobesin and- uh, Exactly, which was very interesting. Yes. Yeah. Okay, the, the one uh, used for the lung, for, for the stomach, I mean, sorry. For the stomach and for the stomach, upper GI, exactly. So, so uh, I think many, many people will agree with you on uh, platinum first line, platinum combination of platinum docetaxel or platinum etoposide. I think all of these regimens are right. And we'll wait and see, and please keep us uh, informed. Definitely, definitely. I'm interesting to, to see his CT. Maybe after two weeks, he will do it. So Absolutely. We'll see. yes. Uh, just remind us, Dr. Uh, Amin, did he have bone metastasis? Uh, no, no, actually. There, there is some there is some lesions. I think there is one lesion or something like that, but I am not recalling we did for him bone scan. But in the pet, it showed there is some, some, I think there is some lesions, yes, some bone lesions, but minimal. Uh, Dr. Elgarni, do you have any questions or uh, any suggestions to this well, case? No, actually, but uh, you know, usually for uh, rare cases or rare histology, it's always interesting to have the molecular profile for those uh, patients. You might find something that uh, might uh, help you in the second line or third line. Uh, it would be interesting to know the tumor mutation burden in this patient. So if you can use immunotherapy, the microsatellite uh, instability status, uh, BRCA mutation, I don't know, but I think it's for patient with, you know, uh, rare presentation, rare histology, and you have access to that, I would, I would do it. I agree with you 100%. If I, if I were a national guard, I'd probably do a BRCA1 and 2. And um, due to the, uh, the, the, the benefit of platinums in those, in those cancers, so, so in BRCA positive cancers, definitely something I would consider. But I, I read about some like uh, genetic analysis in small cell or neuroendocrine. It is like mutual exclusive. We did not find anything. I don't know about this. Is this is uh, right, uh, uh, Hamad? If you can ask. You know, I, I have a patient with small cell. Uh, she's a thirty-year-old uh, woman. She was diagnosed as a small cell lung cancer, despite she's not smoker. And we reviewed the pathology twice. The initial pathology was really consistent with small cell cancer. However, the second, uh, the, the KI-67 was 90%. And she was treated with, uh, as you did, with uh, platinum-based chemotherapy with etoposide, no response. Then she was, she was switched to uh, immunotherapy with no response. She always you know, achieved stable disease. And the interesting thing about that patient that 
if in for patient with small cell, you would see some response with platinum-based chemotherapy. Even for her disease, she only shows stable disease. And giving the, 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 the uh, weird way of presentation and the age, and she is not smoker, and the histology, although it was uh, reviewed twice, I decided to repeat her biopsy from a new lesion that was in the left groin. And when we repeat the biopsy, it showed that she has a neuroendocrine tumor with KI 67 of 40. So I, wow. yeah, so I went further and I sent her for foundation one uh, uh, testing. And at that stage, she was uh, ECOG 3. And actually, I was planning to discuss with the family the goal of care. This was two years ago. And she came back to have a novel ROS1 uh, fusion uh, mutation. So wow. I started her on uh, uh, carizetinib. And since that time till now, she's back to work. She's ECOG zero. Her PET scan two months ago was no evidence of disease. Much so, so yeah, sometimes you, you will find some cases. That's why I'm saying that, you, you know, for rare histology and rare presentation, you might find something that can help you. Very interesting, Allah, Dr. Muhammad. Wallahi, do we have any questions from uh, the audience? The audience, maybe. I don't, I don't see questions. Okay. Uh, anyways, I found it really, really interesting. All of the presentations you guys presented today were, were excellent. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, as usual. We learned a lot from them. And it was a pleasure for me, Saraha, to moderate this session. I would like to thank uh, both of you guys and hoping to meet you, inshallah, soon in Riyadh or in Dammam to uh, yeah. go over things, inshallah, with Nilla Ta'ala. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nidal. It was our pleasure. And thank you very much, Dr. Amir, for this interesting cases and excellent moderation, uh, Nidal. And we thank our audience uh, to be with us. And uh, hope to see them in our uh, third series in August, inshallah, with the challenges cases in oncology. And assalamu uh, alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.